continuing the account of Jesus. Jesus has just done the great sermon on the plain. He has done the sermon on the mount. After he does the sermon on the mount, it says that he makes his way over to Capernaum. And then after last week, if you were here last week, uh, we leave Jesus in Capernaum. And then today we're going to pick it up with him leaving Capernaum and making his way to a little town by the name of Nain. A town by the name of Nain. And so, if you're familiar with the story, I know you'll know it well. If you're not familiar with the story, I hope that you will catch something very important today. I'm going to begin reading verse number 11. Soon afterward, and that's soon after the events in Capernaum, soon after he went down to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who has died was being carried out. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow indeed. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and he touched the coffin. Your Bible might say the bayir. How many of us know what a bayir is? Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the bearers of the bayir stood still. And he said to the young man, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up again and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us. And God himself has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole area of Judea and all the surrounding countryside. Let's pray together. Father, as we take a look at this passage and we take a look at this event, Lord, help us to do more than just look at the scriptures. May the scriptures look at us. May we be sifted by them and pure wheat poured out. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, the little town of Nain on your map is right there. Now, they've been up here in Capernaum, and this is about 25 miles. And so it wasn't like he had just left the church and walked out to the fireside room. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, he left and walked over to El Rodeo. This was a major undertaking. In fact, 25 miles in many ways was considered a one or a two day journey. I'm going to move this so I can see everybody in the front row. There we go. Uh, and so uh, it says, and soon afterwards. Now, soon after what happened in Capernaum. Now, if you go back, do you remember what happened in Capernaum? There was a man there by, who was a centurion, and his daughter or his servant was sick. And because his servant was sick, he sent for Jesus. And then he said, you, you know, wait a second. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. And then Jesus, now, somebody said to me, could Jesus' physical body be in two places at one time? It almost made it sound like you said that last week. No, what I meant to say was this, that Jesus' physical body could be here, but he could heal somebody a hundred miles away. His physical body did not have to be in the physical presence in order for that physical healing to take place. And so his physical body was still in the synagogue in Capernaum, but he had already healed the, the sick uh, servant over the, uh, the uh, centurion's house. And so he himself could only be in one place at one time. But he was not limited by time and place in order to heal. He could hear about somebody around the world. And you know what? He's still not limited. He still can't heal all around the world without physically being there. And it says that, and then soon after all of this event, and then he took a look at the, the great faith of the centurion, and he looks at the people that was with him. Now remember, who was it that the centurion sent to bring Jesus to him? It was the elders of the church. So he sent the elders of the church, and he looks at the elders of the church, and he said, what? I have never seen such great faith. You know, you may be the leaders of the church, but that man over there has more faith than you. I have never seen such great faith in all of Israel. In all of Israel. And then soon after this event, it says, that, and soon after, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a crowd went with him. And so they are making their way from Capernaum right here around. And you'll see it probably came down this road, down this road. And then there's a little road that goes back up into the mountains. There's a little bit of a mountain down. And they're making their way. But I want you to notice that there's two large crowds. And we will fit into one of those crowds. And sometimes we, it's not like we are in this crowd. How, let me just ask. Anybody care about today's football game? 
Now, there are going to be people who are going to say, I am in this camp. And there are other people who are going to say, I am in this camp. And, and there are other people who are going to say, I don't care about this day and game at all. Just make sure the commercials are good. <laughs> I am in that camp. And, and did you know that there are two big camps that are going to be in the stadium today? Is that correct? Down in Miami? And there's going to be the people that is for this group and there's people for this group. Do you think some of the people midway will all of a sudden pull off their jersey and run over to the other side and say, I have been redeemed. I am no longer uh, red. I am now scarlet. <laughs> Pretty much that the colors red and scarlet. Yes. Okay. There's two crowds. And did you know that sometimes we will fit in one of the two crowds, but don't be surprised if we change sides periodically. Now, how many of you would say it never happened, never happened, never happened to me? How many of us realized that one time we were on the wrong side of the cross and we changed yes. sides? Let's be careful whose jersey we wear. Be careful whose jersey we wear. There are two large crowds. Now, the first crowd is excited. They are spiritually excited. They have seen Jesus do what? They have seen Jesus teach. They have heard and some have seen Jesus heal. He has spoken in the crowds. I have no idea why it's doing that. Let's not worry about it. If it gets too bad, we'll just turn it off. Uh, so uh, these people are all spiritually pumped up. They have seen Jesus. They have heard Jesus. They have walked with Jesus. They have talked with Jesus. They have eaten with Jesus. They are literally, and, and I don't like to use this phrase too regularly, but, but they're excited. They're not just on fire for God, but they are excited. You know, I've heard uh, people say, that, I want to be on fire. Uh, I just want to grow slow. Like Pastor Darrell said, I want to grow slow like an oak tree. Let me just tell you, that could be a very boring Christian life if that's the only excitement you've got. Uh, you ever just stand there and watch an oak tree grow? Okay, now let me just tell you, I know what he means when he says that. I don't want to burn out on the Lord real quick. Because how many of us have seen people flare up for God and then burn out? So we need to be slow growing like a tree planted by the river, which yields its fruit in its season. That's very biblical for Pastor Darrell. But let's not forget that we should be excited about what God is, who God is, and what God is doing at the same time. We should be exploding with new growth as we slowly grow next to the world. I'm going to turn it off so you this. I don't know why we're having interference today, but you guys should be able to hear me without it. So let's not have the distraction. Okay, so soon afterwards, there's a crowd, and they are as excited as they can be, and they run head on to a crowd in a crowd of human discouragement. Let's see the two crowds. And soon after this, he went to a town called Nain and his disciples, and this great spiritual, fervent crowd went with them. And as they drew near the gate, behold, there was another crowd coming out. And there were the crowds that had just been to a quote-unquote funeral. Now, funerals were not at all like funerals are today. Uh, many of you I know have heard about my family. My family are very, very Southern. Uh, my dad believed in having the funeral in the house. And so when my sister died, my sister's casket was right there in the living room. And every day we I would walk out, we would, you know, the day would continue. But there she was, open casket, just laid out in my living room. Uh, you go to breakfast, you go to lunch, you come back in. And for seven days, my sister's body was laid out in our living room. And then a year later, my grandfather's body was laid out for seven days in our living room. Uh, and to have dead bodies laying in my living room was a normal thing for me as a child. And they left the casket open. They didn't close them at night. Uh, and so uh, it was just discouraging all the time. It was depressing all the time. For weeks on end, all the time. Uh, and so uh, there was this one group that is spiritually excited, and then there's this other group, and as soon as the person would die, they would go ahead and wait for four days. Now the reason for this is they had a belief that up until three days after death, life could come back into the body. But on the fourth day, you were dead dead. Prior to that, you were just dead. Anybody remember there was a person by the name of Lazarus? And Lazarus was dead, and he found out about the news, and Jesus waited until the fourth day to go back. Why? To make sure that everybody knew he was what? Dead, dead. He was dead, dead. Okay, and this young man is dead, dead. They have waited four days. And here is this group that is experienced. How many of us have been spiritually excited about what God is doing and we run head on into somebody that might even be another believer, but they are so caught up in <coughs> discouragement? 
What do we do? Isn't that the story that Jesus is trying to teach? What do we do when we are excited about God? We are growing in God. We are that oak tree growing day by day, yielding its fruit in its season, and we smack dab into a world that is hurting and discouraged, even fellow brothers and sisters. What do we do? How do we act? What should we, what should we do? What should we not do? How about just follow the example of Jesus? Okay, I think that would be a good one. And so we have these two crowds, and then we have the widow. Now, this word here, it says that this, behold, a young man has died. He was being carried out, and he was the son, and she was a widow. Now, this word here for widow means her husband has not only died, but she is beyond the age of possibly thinking about getting remarried and beyond the age of having more children. So that means what? That her only source of income was going to be what? Either the benevolence of the people in the town or to start turning to prostitution or other types of illicit, un ungodly behaviors. And so here is this woman who is in death mode. Husband, dead. Son, dead. Life, as far as I know it, is also what? You know, there's a lot of zombie people walking around the world today. Now, they may be still alive, but it's as if everything is just nothing but what? Wrong and dead. Dead and wrong. Everything is dead. And so he walks straight up to them. And he has, the Bible says, that Jesus saw her and had compassion on her. This is the word for compassion in the Bible. Anybody want to give that word a chop? Let me just say that the noun for this word is splagna. Splagna. And it literally means for your stomach to roll over. It means that you are so caught up in the event that it makes you physically sick. Has anybody ever seen something and you all of a sudden had those butterflies in your stomach? Anybody ever see something or hear something? Sometimes I can hear about somebody having a blood test. And I get, Ugh. I get kind of squeamish. Uh, and, you know, that's the, what it is. And back in the Old Testament, they believed that the lave was the center of your stomach. And that's why they would, they would say, gather up your loins and let's go. They would say, man up, woman up, let's go. Uh, I know this is affecting you, but something still needs to be done. We've got to get past the initial shock of it all and get into what can be done, what should be done. How do we take care of this? And so it says, Jesus looked at her and his stomach rolled. Now, the noun version of this word shows up ten times in the New Testament. In other words... This should be a regular event for the people of God. We should be able to take a look at things and say, that turns my stomach. We should look at sin and say, that turns my stomach. We should take a look at things happening to, sin, to, to sinful people and say, that still turns my stomach. Remember what we just read? It says that if something happens, don't look down at the man who stole because he was starving to death. He still needs to pay, but don't hate him. It should turn your stomach that people are that poor, that hungry. How many of us have gotten so desensitized by people holding <clears throat> signs that it doesn't even bother us anymore? A famous pastor that I used to know said this, what bothers me is when what used to bother me doesn't bother me anymore. It should splog not us. It should turn our stomach. And it says that Jesus had compassion on her. Notice, did she even ask for compassion? No. Did you know that many times when desperate people are in depression and discouragement mode, they don't even want to ask anybody. They do a thing called cocooning. Now, what does that mean? They suck it all in. But why would God care? Why does God care? God doesn't care. You don't care. People don't care. Where were you when my husband died? And we'll go back and we'll replay all of these things on the negative side, which will draw us farther and farther away from the one who wants to give us compassion, as well as the one he has called to be compassion givers. We'll pull away from church. We'll pull away from our friends. We'll pull away from our family. We'll go ahead and get in our bedroom, shut the door, turn off the lights, turn on Dr. Phil. Because nobody understands me like Oprah. It says that Jesus had compassion on her. And notice, what do you think this big crowd who is spiritually high is thinking? You know? Did you know that some times there is a thing called funeral etiquette? 
And we're not supposed to laugh or smile or have a good time at the funeral. Now, there are other people, that's all they do is laugh and drink and have a good time. I did a funeral for a bunch of bikers one time, and you would have thought we were not at a funeral at all. Now, don't get me wrong. But how many of us can turn on and turn off our emotions based on what we think the emotion of that moment dictates? We're walking in, we're walking with Jesus, we walk right up, we're just kind of like, oh, it's okay. Let's put on a funeral face. Did you know that in other places other than California, when a funeral procession drives by, people actually pull off in Scottsdale. They can legally run red lights to keep the funeral procession together. Not in California, but in other places. And not just the Bible Belt. And so it says that his stomach rolled over and he walks up to the, to the bayir. Now, how many of us know what a bayir looks like? I'm going to show you a picture of one in just a minute. And he walks up and he seeks to encourage her. Now, gentlemen, let me just tell you, you're not Jesus. You can't do this. But he walks up and says, don't cry. Now, when was the last time that worked in your house? Now, maybe the reason it doesn't work is because we're the source of the tears. <coughs> that if somebody knew that you were the source of encouragement, maybe you could get away with it, don't cry. But if you're not going to walk up and touch people the way Jesus touched people, don't try to heal them with your words and do nothing with yourself. Because that's just do what I say and not as I do. Jesus walked up, and he authenticated his word. What was that? Do not cry. Now, many people would say, Jesus didn't preach it. Yes, he did. And what did he say? I can dry your tears. What was his sermon? I can take care of you when you're discouraged. And what, how did he preach it? Don't cry. Don't cry. And then he says he walks up, and he touches. Now, the Greek word for by ear is soros. Uh, it means chariot. Uh, uh, it means casket. Uh, but it, it, it's a chariot that has many different usages. It looks like this. And so what they would do is there would be people on the stadia, and they would carry it through, and, and, and this was not in a box. This was not in a closed confinement. The body would be open. Remember, it has been dead now for four days, it has been embalmed as far as they embalm it, and as rich as you are, and they would carry it out. And this is what Jesus walked up to. So it wasn't like he had to walk up to a casket and open up the casket and reach into the casket. The body was right there in plain sight as well as in plain grasp. And here's the people carrying it, a large crowd with them. Did you know back then they had a thing called professional mourners? They would show up, and they had the ability to just produce tears on demand. They could all of a sudden walk up and say, uh, do, you, do you need to be more somber occasionally? <laughs> and they could just kick it into mourning mode, and the tears will come. And they had them, and when I say professional, many times they were professional because they got paid to do so. Now, many of them would just show up to make sure that it was a tearful event. And so now we've got this crowd of excited worshipers walking into the city. We have got this crowd of discouraged, depressed mourners walking out of the city. And both of them walk head on into who? Jesus. Because where does Jesus want to meet us? Right where we are. In the middle of our daily life. Right there in the middle of it all. And it says that he walked, walked up and he touched the, the coffin. Now let me just say... That this was a very easy thing to do. You probably saw that. But it was completely unacceptable. If you were a holy person, you did not touch dead people because that rendered you what? Ceremonially unclean. And so if Jesus was going in to preach at all, as soon as he touched them in the eyes of many of the people who were so caught up into that system of ideology, not theology, but ideology, they all of a sudden thought, you can't be a holy guy or you never would have touched because holy people don't do that. Even unholy people don't do that. It was the worst of manners. What's wrong with this guy? Doesn't he know the mother's right here crying and her eyes out? Doesn't, doesn't he even care that she's lost her husband? What's wrong with this guy? It was completely unacceptable. Now, let's catch this. As soon as he 
walks up and he touches the casket, the by here, it says that those carrying it out stopped. They stood still. Look at verse 14. And he came up and he touched the by here, and the bearers stood still. Why? They were in shock. What do I do? What do I do? We've never had this happen before. What do we do? Now, how many of us know that the only right thing to do when you don't know what to do is stop? Unfortunately, you know what too many of us do? When we don't know what to do, we, we have a tendency to try to make too many decisions too fast. Let's just keep going. I can remember one time I was driving, and I had no idea where I was. It was before the days of GPS. It was before the days, you know, where you could just yank out your, you know, your, your phone and type it into MapQuest and find out where you are. And Margaret said, we're lost, aren't we? I said, yes, we are, but we're making great time. <laughs> We're making great time. And so they stop, and then Jesus, I want you to notice, he says to the mother, don't cry, but who's got his fixation? Because Jesus knows if I raise up this son, her tears will stop. Many times when we're dealing with the person who's crying, we need to know what is it that they're crying about, and instead of dealing with the person, we need to deal with the issue. But so many times, we just want to show this person compassion. We just want to say, oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Don't worry. Now, all of those things are good. But if it doesn't deal with the reason why they're crying, it is what? False hope. In fact, it's no hope. All it is is a momentary words of affirmation that leave us as soon as we walk away, they walk away, and the body's still dead. So what did Jesus do? He walked up to the young man. Does Jesus know he's been dead for four days? Well, of course he does. Some people might even say this. Did he stay in Capernaum just long enough to make sure he didn't get there until the fourth day? And so Jesus walks up to the young man and he talks to him. Now, I've been in many funerals. I've conducted many funerals. I've had a lot of people in my family die. And I've got to say, I've talked to the body before. But anybody know anybody? If you've experienced that, you just walk up there and you look at the body and say, I am so sorry. I miss you. I would, my dad was the worst singer the world has ever known. And, and when I saw my dad, I said, I'd do anything to hear all those bad notes. Now, when I see my dad in heaven, if everything is perfect, he will never sing flat again. So the next time I sing, he will be singing some great notes. He walks up to the young man, and Jesus says this, I say to you. I say to you. Because why? Because even though that man was dead on earth, that man was still what? Who he was. He himself was alive somewhere. Is that correct? Was he still alive somewhere? So Jesus didn't say, I say to this body. But I say to you, that means that we are all, once we die, we are going to still be us somewhere. How important is it for us to be in the presence of God by a true gospel instead of a phony gospel? I say to you, what does he say? Arego. Arego. Not oregano, but arego. He says arego. That means wake up. <coughs> Notice this. It means get lifted up, and it means exist again. He did not recreate this young man. He brought him from the holy place beyond the grave and brought him back and put him right back into that chassis that he called his body. He, he woke him up, he lifted him up, and he brought him back into human existence. And only God can do that. Only God can speak into existence what was either not there to begin with or what was already there. Only God can say to a non-existent, let there be light. Only God can say to a dead body, come back. <coughs> Only God can do that. The young man sat and started talking. Now here's my next question. Wouldn't you like to hear what he said? Notice, there are no words recorded from this young man. Because you know what? Chance not there would have probably said, he said there was a light, he said that there was this, he said there was that, and everybody would be talking about the things that he thought he saw rather than the man who brought him back in the first place. How many of us get caught up in the afterlife of the dead person?
person than the person who can bring life into life. And then the people notice this. It says that they all became phobiaized. Anybody ever hear of phobos, where we get our word fear? And it says that they were phobiaized. They freaked out. They just literally freaked out. Ah! Now, this part of them was freaking out with excitement. Part of them was freaking out with, what's going on here? But what about the crowd who has just seen him heal somebody up there? Said what? He does it all the time. <laughs> he freaks us out all the time. This is nothing new. He freaks us out all the time. And notice now what they say in response to what they just experienced. They said this. Fear seized them all, and they all glorified God, saying, now what you catch is, they all glorified, a great prophet has arisen among us. Now guess what? Moses said this, that after I leave, and after I die, God will raise up a great prophet from among you. Jesus is prophet and priest and king. But let's not forget, he is still part prophet. He can tell what has happened. He can foretell what is going to happen. And he can foretell that means make sense of what he has already said. A great prophet has arisen among us. And they go on to say this. God has visited his people. Notice they are now calling Jesus what? What did they just call Jesus? What did they just call Jesus? They called him Emmanuel. God has visited his people. And you think maybe, just maybe, they thought back on Isaiah 7. David, are you teaching on Isaiah 7 today? Yeah. Yeah. On Isaiah 7, when God says this, Hear, O house of Israel, the Lord himself will give you a sign. His name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. His name will be Emmanuel, which means what? God has risen up a prophet, and God is with us. It is the, the, this event in Luke chapter 7 is the actual embodiment of Isaiah 7 coming to pass. Not just in the garden, not just in the, in the Bethlehem, but God himself has visited us because the people proclaimed it. Not just Mary and Joseph, not just some magi, not just some shepherds, but who? The people themselves have declared it what? God himself has visited his people. What do we take as we get ready for the Lord's Supper? God came here in the form of Jesus Christ? Yes. But is Jesus God? Yes. And what do we need when we're excited about our faith? We need more God. What do we need when we are depressed in life? We need more God. In other words, whether we're flying high and we're walking and flying on wings of eagles, or whether we're down in the pit of despair, we need more Jesus all the time. Just get me Jesus. More and more Jesus. It's not even recorded that this woman even asked God to intervene. Now this says what? That God knows what we're going through and he doesn't have to wait for us to all of a sudden start praying about it. He's already acted. It says that before we hear are even compassionate enough to pray, he's already compassionate enough to change things. His compassion is not based on our prayer life. Prayer changes us. God's compassion changes us. Jesus changes us in the middle of our losses. I don't know what you have in your life that you think you can't live without. But if it doesn't start with Jesus, it's the wrong starting. It needs to start with Jesus. God found her. Now, I, I can't prove this, but it, it is a wonderful teaching point. That Jesus just happened to be walking into the city of Nain when that casket just happened to be walking out of the city of Nain. God found her, and the miracle, watch this, the miracle was not to authenticate just his words. The biggest miracle I find in this entire event is that Jesus is a compassionate God. Because how many times do we hear about God being a mean God? The God of the Old Testament. Let me tell you, the God of the Old Testament is Jesus. And Jesus in the New Testament is God. And he is what? He is a compassionate God. All the time. I'm going to end with this slide. We are about to go into the Lord's Supper. And, and if you're carrying around some
some dead stuff on your body today? In your head? God wants to meet you where you are. So before a small piece of bread or a small cup of juice comes to you, God wants to meet you right where you are. And, and say, what is it that is bothering you today? What is it that is causing you conflict today? What is it that is depressing you today? What is it that is preventing you? And he can even ask this, what is it that's making you so excited today? Because no matter how high our spiritual life may be, or how low our spiritual depression may be, what does God want us to do? He wants to meet us in the middle and tell us, and say what? God is with Who shall I be? Who shall I be? The Lord is with I'm going to invite you to examine yourself as I invite you all.